with a little humorous story. It's about a monk who joined one of the strictest monasteries possible uh, in addition to the promise or, or the vows of uh, chastity, poverty, and obedience, they also took uh, the vow of silence. But they were able, every ten years, to go to the abbot of the monastery and say two words. But that was all that they could do. They could only say two words out loud uh, every uh, ten years. So this uh, monk, when he first joined, was very active as a monk, did everything that he was supposed to do, observed all the vows perfectly. And then uh, 10 years passed and he had his opportunity to visit the uh, abbot to say his two words. And he goes in and says to the abbot, hard bed. And the abbot says, well, thank you very much, brother. Uh, we're glad you're here and go back to your uh, room and back to your duties. And in 10 more years, you can come and say your next two words. Ten more years pass, and the uh, monk goes to see the abbot, and he says, bad food. And the abbot says, thank you, brother. Go back to your uh, cell and continue to pray and work, and in ten more years, you'll be able to say your next two words. So the next two, ten years pass, and the monk goes in to see the abbot, and he says, I quit. <laughs> and the abbot said, it's just as well. You've done nothing but complain ever since you've been here. <laughs> <laughs> so. What well, little I will say tonight about uh, the Catholic Mass and the Sacrament of the Holy Eucharist is but the tip of the iceberg on what can be said about the Holy Eucharist. In fact, there are volumes and volumes of books uh, written about what it is that Catholics believe about the Holy Eucharist and what it is that Christ does for us when we celebrate the Mass. But before we can talk about the Holy Eucharist, we must talk about faith. And before we talk about faith, we have to talk about what it does not take uh, to believe. Uh, uh, it does not take faith to believe that Jesus of Nazareth lived 2,000 years ago. That's a fact of history that even an atheist would have to acknowledge. So, you know, when we look at Jesus as a historical figure, uh, atheists and believers alike will have to agree on certain things. And these are the things that atheists and believers would have to agree on. First of all, that he was inclusive in terms of who he invited to be a part of his uh, uh, company, uh, the disciples that he chose. Uh, he also reached out to those that were usually ostracized by the religious establishment of the day. Uh, he reached out to those that were considered unclean or the non-Jew or uh, the one uh, caught in sin or those with contagious diseases. We know that he forgave people. Now, we would say from the perspective of faith that that implied that he is God, but an atheist would have to say that Jesus forgave people because that's a historical fact. He also healed people, and we would have to say that that is historical fact. Now, whether or not you believe that they actually were cured is up for debate, but, but from the historical point of view, we do know that he healed people. He liked to eat with people, to have meals in the homes of people, and that was a very important part of the Middle Eastern cu culture of that time, and even to this day, that uh, you would break bread with one another, and, and that would bring a bond of unity. But he also challenged people with the Word of God, called them to conversion, to change their lives, and to follow him. So he lived and died, and that does not take faith to believe. That's a historical, provable reality. Belief or faith becomes a factor when we begin to speak about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That after his death and burial, he rose from the dead. Now, from the historical point of view, we can't say that an atheist would have to agree that he rose from the dead because there were no eyewitnesses to the actual event of the resurrection. That happened in the privacy of the tomb. Uh, and as far as we know, the only one in the tomb was Jesus as he was being raised. Now, there may have been angels there, uh, but in terms of the physical physicality of it, only Jesus was there, and then he burst forth from the tomb. The stone was rolled away. We do know... Uh, at that point, it becomes a little bit more historically verifiable that the, the uh, soldiers guarding the tomb were awestruck and in fear about what was occurring. Uh, and then we do know that after the resurrection, uh, he was seen by his apostles, by Mary uh, Magdalene and 
and others, and ultimately St. Paul says that about 500 others saw Jesus after the resurrection. Uh, so we can say that uh, from that point of view, there is a historical reality that people saw Jesus after he was crucified. Um, then on, uh, there was the ascension when he disappeared from uh, people's sight, went back to heaven to send us the Holy Spirit, which came upon the church at Pentecost. These are all things that are, are, are the realm of faith. An atheist probably wouldn't agree that he was raised from the dead. They probably would put forth that maybe it was a hoax uh, that he was even killed and something that was, in fact, the scriptures even say that, uh, that there were those that believed that. Uh, they would say that if Jesus was taken from their sight, there must have been some sort of an illusion that uh, created that phenomenon. Or, and certainly nobody saw the Holy Spirit except the scriptures tell us that it came upon the apostles and the Blessed Virgin Mary as tongues of flame, and they were emboldened to go out and preach the good news. So if we can say this about Jesus, what takes faith and what doesn't take faith, the same is true for the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist or Holy Communion. There are many facts that I can give you about what uh, Holy Communion is. Some elements would take faith to believe, and other elements of the teaching would not take faith to believe. For example, it does not take faith to say that the Holy Eucharist, once it's consecrated, the wafer, as well as the wine that is consecrated, is a symbol of the Lord. An atheist would have to say that at a Catholic Mass, when the priest holds up the Eucharist, either the, the consecrated bread or the consecrated wine, that that is a symbol of Christ, certainly. Uh, uh, it takes no faith to believe that. Uh, it is a symbol of Christ, but it is much more than just a, a symbol that anybody could acknowledge, even somebody that has no faith. Whereas the Catholic Church teaches that once the bread and wine is consecrated, the bread and wine is no longer bread and wine, but actually becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the risen Lord. That it becomes Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, total and complete. And the technical term for this is a philosoph philosophical term, and it's called transubstantiation. That the substance of the bread and wine, once the priest consecrates it at the altar during the words of institution, take this all of you and eat it, this is my body, these are the words that Jesus said over the bread, take this all of you and drink from it, this is my blood poured out for you, what Jesus said over the chalice of wine. And the entire Eucharistic prayer consecrates the bread and wine and changes its substance. Whereas the visual part of it remains the same. Uh, as before, so, but the actual substance, what it is, has become uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. It still appears to be bread and wine, but the spiritual substance is now the risen Lord Jesus Christ. So in a sense, what we can say is that after the consecration of the bread and wine, the bread and wine become metaphors of who it is that we receive in the sense that Jesus is the bread of life. But it's Jesus we're receiving, correct? We're not receiving just bread. We're receiving Jesus who is the bread of life. Or we can say it is Jesus who is the wine of life that brings joy to the heart and warmth to fellowship. But we're not receiving wine uh, that is a symbol of Jesus. We're receiving Jesus who is wine. Does that make sense? Um, that, that, that the bread and wine become a metaphor for uh, the one that we receive. So why do we have the Holy Eucharist and the other sacraments of the church? Now, I'll get into some of the more specifics about the Eucharist in a second. Well, after the resurrection of Jesus, believers wanted to continue to celebrate their faith in the risen Lord uh, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they wanted their celebrations or their worship of God to make visible in a tangible way the presence of Jesus. And all they had to do was to look back at the historical ministry of Jesus, his public ministry, and see that he laid out the criteria by which they would do that. Because all of the sacraments of the church were established by Jesus Christ. And all seven sacraments of the church worship God through Jesus, and the church through these sacraments give thanks to God in one way or another for the wonderful things that God has accomplished in Jesus Christ. So in one way or another, the sacraments reenact some aspect of Jesus' marvelous ministry uh, 
through the use of signs and symbols, visible elements of the earth. For example, a sign or a symbol is something that we can see or hear which points or tells us something else that we cannot see or hear at that time. Uh, in the uh, secular sense, smoke is a sign of fire. You will probably see the smoke before you see the flames. In fact, I was watching the news tonight before I came over here about the uh, um, ocean liner that had a fire in their engine and some of the passengers took pictures of smoke billowing out of the back of the ship. Well, you couldn't see the, the flames, but you knew that there was a fire there. A red light is a sign of danger. Dark clouds are a sign of rain. The flag is a sign of the country. A siren is a sign of an emergency. So this brings us to the definition of what a sacrament is. An outward sign instituted by Christ, and that's the critical element there, that Christ himself has instituted it, to communicate God's love and grace and to enable us to worship God. So the sacraments, the signs of the sacraments point to the unseen presence of the Spirit of the risen Lord or to the actual risen Christ himself. So when I baptize somebody, the sign of the water being placed upon the individual or washed over the individual is a sign of Christ who washes away sins. When we receive the bread and wine that is consecrated at Mass, those are the signs of the hidden Lord that we cannot see, but it is the risen Lord that we are actually receiving. So in the church's worship, the primary signs or symbols of all of the sacraments are uh, usually four elements. The people that gather, along with the minister or the priest or the deacon, the prayers that are said, the scripture of God which is proclaimed, and then each sacrament of the church has a specific sign or a symbol that points to a specific action of Christ which he continues to offer us in the year 2010. As I've mentioned in the past, we have to be very careful in our Catholic faith that we don't uh, look at Jesus as a dead hero from the past that did some wonderful things 2,000 years ago on the earth during his public ministry, but rather we have to see that Jesus continues his ministry even to this day through uh, the ministry of the church and the celebration of her sacraments. So as I mentioned, in baptism, the primary symbol or sign is water that points to Christ who washes us of sin. In confirmation, it's sacred chrism, which points to the Holy Spirit that seeps into our skin, our bones, our very spirit and soul to change the character of who we are and to conform us to Christ. In the Holy Eucharist, it's bread and wine, uh, the bread broken, uh, a sign of Christ's body broken for us, the wine poured out for us, a sign of his blood shed for us. In, con in uh, confession or the sacrament of penance, it's actually the words of forgiveness that the priest offers as he raises his hands, which is a symbol of the laying on of hands. In the anointing of the sick, it's the oil that is smeared upon the forehead and hands of the person who is sick that shows that Christ is like a soothing ointment, like the oil of Olay that revives uh, uh, the sick individual, whether it's a spiritual illness such as sin or a uh, physical illness or even a mental illness. In matrimony, who do you think, uh, what do you think is the sign of matrimony, the symbol of matrimony or marriage? It's not the ring. No. It's not the vows. It's the couple, their lives together. And, and in that sense, the sacrament of matrimony is a little bit different than the other sacraments because it's not the ceremony that is the sacrament, but it's the life lived together, striving to be one in Christ and being a sign of the relationship of Christ to his bride, the church. So it's the life of the couple together. They are, the, the husband and the wife. And the same is true with holy orders. It's not only the, the ordination ceremony that's the sacrament, but it's the, my life as a priest or, or, or the bishop's life as a bishop uh, and what it is that he does uh, in uh, answering that specific call. So in terms of the Holy Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist uh, or the celebration of the Holy Eucharist has many names. The most popular name for the celebration of the Holy Eucharist is the Mass, M-A-S-S, -S, which comes from the Latin conclusion to the Mass when the priest says the Mass is ended, go in peace, and we say thanks be to God. 
We're not saying thanks be to God because the Mass is finally over, but uh, because the priest is commissioning us to uh, go and be disciples of the Lord in the world. So we're thankful that he's nourished us with his word, with his body, blood, soul, and divinity. We've experienced his sacrifice on the cross, and the deacon or the priest says, go in peace, the Mass is ended, thanks be to God. In Latin, it is ite misa est, the Mass is ended, or more accurately, or more literally translated, it is, you are dismissed, uh, you are commissioned. Uh, and so, um, the English word for Misa is translated Mass, but technically it should be Dismissal. You see the, the similar Missa and Dismissal and Misa in Latin. Uh, it's, 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 it's interesting to me that we would use the ending of, or the last few words of the Mass, to describe what the whole thing is. Because really, what the Mass is meant to do is to prepare us to go back to where we're living most of our life, and to bring Christ with us, and to evangelize others, and to uh, uh, encourage others in the ways of the faith. Another term for uh, the Mass is the Lord's Supper, that's appropriate to use that term, or the Divine Liturgy, or Holy Communion, or the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, because every Mass enables us to be at the foot of the cross of Jesus, which gains for us eternal life, or the Holy Eucharist. Now, in terms of the term Holy Eucharist, that can uh, be a generic term for the complete celebration of the Mass, or it could be a specific term for receiving uh, Holy Communion, uh, the actual consecrated elements, the, the bread or the wine. Um, the oldest term for the Mass is the breaking of the bread, which is a very biblical term. Uh, remember the um, post-resurrection event when Jesus is on the road to, uh, or the two disciples are on the road to Emmaus, and this visitor comes and starts conversing with them, and they don't recognize who he is, but it's Jesus. They should have recognized who he is, but evidently the risen Lord uh, looked different to them than he did prior to his resurrection or they were just uh, uh, not fully informed as to, maybe it was dark, we don't know. Uh, but they didn't expect Jesus to be there because he, they thought he was dead. So they're sharing with the risen Lord, don't you know what's been going on about this man Jesus who we thought was going to be the Messiah and they've killed him and we're grieving now. And uh, if you can only imagine Jesus probably uh, snickering under his breath, you know, well, I'm, I'm him. And, but they don't recognize him. When is it that they do recognize him? In the breaking of the bread, which is the Eucharist. What he was doing was offering them the Lord's Supper again, similar to what he did at the Last Supper. And uh, so the breaking of the bread is one of the oldest names uh, of, for the Eucharist. So the celebration of the Holy Eucharist is the central way that Catholics worship God. In fact, we would say it is the source and summit of our Catholic faith. And therefore, it is so important that the Church expects us to be there every Sunday. Now the expectation is, first of all, that we recognize that this is critical for our salvation because we are placed at the foot of the cross and made partakers of the cross of Christ at every Mass. But also it's the way that we keep holy the Lord's Day, Sunday, uh, which is uh, part of the Ten Commandments, the Third Commandment, keep holy the Sabbath. For us, Sunday is the Sabbath. Um, and it is also the way in which we sustain and nourish our faith. So in the celebration of the Mass, or the Holy Eucharist, Catholics gather with the visible leader of the community, which is the priest, the, the Christian community, or their particular parish, to remember what Jesus did to bring salvation, to overcome sin and death, and we give thanks to God for that. In fact, the, the word Eucharist comes from the Greek word, uh, which literally translated into English would be thanksgiving. Uh, so in a sense, uh, when we say Holy Eucharist, we're saying Holy Thanksgiving. Uh, and what we're doing is we're giving thanks to God for His sacrifice on the cross, for His death and resurrection, for Him giving us His Holy Spirit, and for forgiving us and opening for us uh, the gates of heaven. Therefore, the Holy Eucharist is a memorial of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross uh, and a memorial of his resurrection um, to new life. Now, 
When I say a memorial, I don't mean like a monument that we build to uh, remember somebody. You know, uh, uh, there's a memorial for 9-11 uh, being established uh, where the World Trade Center was. Uh, it's a physical thing. I'm not talking about that kind of a memorial. The Mass is a memorial from the point of view of being a living reality that brings forward from the past an event, in this case the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, and makes it present for us today. And that's very Jewish. Uh, the Jews did that with the Passover. They would remember the events of the past, uh, the escape from Egypt, going through uh, the Red Sea, parting for them, uh, the angel of death passing over them, uh, if they painted the doorpost with blood. And when they remembered that at the Passover, it was like they were experiencing it again in the present. Well, that's what happens in the Eucharist because it's based upon a, a Passover meal that we're bringing forward something from the past. Now one of the things that uh, many Protestants will accuse P Catholics in terms of the Mass is they think that we are making a new sacrifice every time we celebrate the Mass. That the one sacrifice of Jesus 2,000 years ago for our salvation wasn't enough. And so we have to re-sacrifice Christ every day uh, ra rather than just trust in the one sacrifice that occurred 2,000 years ago. Well, that's the false way of understanding the Mass, or the wrong way, I should say. What we're doing is, in a sense, by pulling a past event forward in the celebration of the Mass, we're also acknowledging that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross 2,000 years ago at Golgotha while it occurred in a particular time, at a particular place, because of the resurrection is no longer bound by a particular time or a particular place. It's now part of history. I'm sorry, it is part of, of eternity. It's also part of history, but it's a part of eternity. So in the Mass, what we're doing is piercing into the dimension of eternity to experience the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross uh, so that it is as though we are there, uh, but we're there in the present. Does that make sense? So that's what the, the, the celebration of the Mass is primarily meant to do for us, to unite us to the cross of Jesus. And that's why the crucifix plays such an important role in the Mass, and is usually centrally located, because the Mass reenacts in an unbloody way the one sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and brings it to the present, or we experience it in the present by piercing into that uh, dimension that we call eternity. So the Holy Eucharist is based upon the Jewish Passover feast. In the Jewish Passover feast, Jews recall that God had chosen them, that he had guided them through the desert, that he had freed them from slavery, and in loving gratitude they remembered the gifts that God had given them. On the Passover feast, they reenacted in a prayerful way this living memorial of an event that had taken place in past history, but the blessings of which was still flowing down to them in the present. Then they would sacrifice a lamb to God in the temple, then take some of the lamb home to eat and share as a festival meal. And this reminded them of the lamb's blood that was painted on the doorposts of homes so that the uh, death of the angel of death might pass over them. Fast forward to Holy Thursday, the night before Jesus died. In the context of a Passover meal that I just described at the Last Supper, Jesus becomes the Lamb or the new Passover. He is the new and everlasting Passover from death to life. He is the sacrifice that brings new life. In fact, we really begin to understand the Catholic Mass when we understand Holy Thursday and the Last Supper. Because at the Last Supper, what Jesus is doing with his apostles is anticipating what's going to happen the next day on Good Friday. So in the context of this Passover meal, he changes the meaning of the bread and wine. So at the end of the meal is when he takes the bread, that, the normal bread that was on the table, and he says, take this all of you and eat it. This is my body which is given up for you. Now keep in mind that the apostles didn't really understand what was going to happen yet. 
uh, on Good Friday. He had not been arrested yet, he had not been put on trial, and he had not been put to death. So they were a little bit befuddled by what he was saying. The same thing, he takes the wine and he says, take this all of you and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood which will be shed for you. As often as you do this, you will do it in memory of me. So right there, Jesus has given the twelve apostles the uh, ritual that they will use after his resurrection, after the Pentecost event, to remember their Passover, which is what? Say that again? But what is, their, what is our Passover? It's not the Last Supper. What is our Passover? Well, the Eucharist is what points to what our Passover is. What is it? Well, the resurrection is part of it, but what's more important, uh, what happens before the resurrection that's necessary for this to be our... The sacrifice on the cross. What happens the next day? Good Friday is our Passover. The apostles, just like you all, didn't get it. Uh, so <laughs> at the time of the Last Supper, okay. Uh, so at the time of the Last Supper, they were kind of like, what's he talking about? But after Good Friday, and especially after Easter Sunday, they got it. Uh, they understood what he was talking about. And then after Pentecost, they began to develop a ritual by which they would continue to remember uh, what Jesus did to become our Passover. And that he is the Lamb of God. And that we receive him physically as food and drink uh, in the Holy Eucharist. So the Mass is divided into two parts, as you, as you should know, the, the two major parts. The Liturgy of the Word, where we hear Scripture uh, and a, a homily. Usually on Sunday we would have uh, an Old Testament reading, the Psalm, which is a responsorial Psalm that we would participate in. A New Testament reading, usually from one of the Epistles, it could be from the Acts of the Apostles. And then uh, we stand for the Gospel, and it's a reading from one of the four Gospels. That's on Sunday. During the week, we eliminate one of the readings uh, to make the Mass a little bit simpler for a daily Mass. You would have uh, the first reading, which could be from the Old Testament or from the New Testament, the Psalm, and then we go right into the Gospel reading. Uh, so either way, uh, uh, it still con constitutes the, uh, the liturgy of the Word. And Catholics believe that God is communicating to us uh, his action in the world uh, and what constitutes salvation history and how we should live as his followers. Then the second part of the Mass that follows the priest homily, which is not optional on Sunday, but could be optional during the week, when, if you came to Mass during the week, not here at St. Joseph's, but at other places, the priest may not give a, might not give a, a homily, and that could be eliminated. The daily Mass is meant to be briefer, because we know people have to go to work, and uh, it's not as festively um, celebrated as it would be on Sunday normally. But then we go into the second part of the Mass, and that's the Liturgy of the Eucharist, where bread and wine is placed on the altar, the Eucharistic prayer is prayed, at which point the bread and wine is consecrated by the priest, uh, who acts in the person of Christ. So for the Mass to be valid, you must have a validly ordained priest to do it, because who does the priest represent at Mass? Jesus. So what I'm doing, it's not me consecrating the bread and wine, it's Christ doing it, and he's working through me, and that's why I'm a sacramental sign of, of, the, of the risen Lord or of Christ uh, uh, continuing to celebrate for us what he began at the, uh, the Last Supper. And then, of course, there's before the Liturgy of the Word, there's the introductory rite, uh, which would include the sign of the cross, the greeting, the penitential rite. The glorious is said on Sunday and major feast days, but not normally during the week. And then the opening prayer, which is called the collect, it's spelled collect, but it's pronounced collect to uh, distinguish it from the other meaning of the word collect. Uh, then, and collect would be the prayer that brings together the first part of the Mass. And then after the homily on Sunday there would be the creed, but on uh, the weekday the creed is eliminated. You'd have the general intercessions and then go right into the pre preparation of the bread and wine, the actual Eucharistic prayer, which would include the Sanctus or the Holy Holy, then the great amen, we'd say the Lord's Prayer together to prepare ourselves to receive communion. Uh, the Lamb of God is said or sung, and then we receive communion, and then there's a prayer after communion and the final blessing and, and the dismissal to go. Um, now in the Catholic Church, there are two 
ways to celebrate the Catholic Mass. Uh, and this is uh, something relatively new in the history of the church. Um, up until about 1965, the Catholic Mass was very elaborate and celebrated in the Latin language, except for just a little bit of Greek, which was the Kyrie, that's Greek, not Latin. Kyrie, eleison, Christe, eleison, Kyrie, eleison. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, that's Greek. Uh, but the rest of the Mass, including the readings, believe it or not, were uh, read or sung in Latin. Now the homily was always spoken in the vernacular of the language of the people. The priest would uh, be facing in the same direction as the people, in other words, with his back to the people, and the ritual would be a little bit uh, more elaborate and there would be a little bit more repetition or the duplication of various things. Uh, so it would take a little bit longer. Well, between 1962 and 1965, uh, there was what is called the Second Vatican Council that drew up a document asking that uh, the sacraments of the church, especially the Mass, uh, undergo some revisions to make it more uh, accessible to the laity. It didn't give any specifics on what to do, very few specifics, but left it to the Pope and a commission of bishops to decide what that product would be or, or how the Mass would be revised. So eventually, by 1970, the, the Mass was revised and simplified. The major revision was that we were allowed now, for the first time since maybe uh, uh, the early church, to celebrate the Mass in the language of the people. Now keep in mind, Latin used to be the language of the people, but then, you know, people moved on and the church kept the Latin, but other languages evolved. And then Latin became a dead language, except for the church which continued it. So we were allowed to have the Mass in English, Italian, Spanish, any language uh, that people spoke, the Mass could be translated into that. And then secondly, they were, we were asked, they, they, they designed the Mass with what is called noble simplicity. They eliminated some of the duplications that were already in the Mass. They made it simpler, a little bit less ritualized, so that people could understand it better. And that's what we call the Mass, or that's what the Mass is today that you would experience on Sunday. Well, about three years ago, Pope Benedict XVI gave permission to every priest in the world and every bishop in the world to once again celebrate the older form of the Mass, which is in Latin. In 1970, when the new Mass was instituted in the church, priests were forbidden to celebrate the older form because they wanted to establish the newer form. And there were just some very rare instances where, people could, where priests could celebrate the older form. And that created a lot of uh, ill will amongst people who found the older form of the Mass more meaningful to them, more familiar, uh, and what had sustained and nourished their faith for most of their lives. And they didn't understand, well, if it's wrong now, is it wrong then? And what's wrong with it? Why can't we have the old Mass? And, and so there's been a controversy in the church about that for the last 40 years. So Pope Benedict basically put an end to that and said, you can have either form. And it's up to the priest and the parishioners to decide uh, which form they would like to have. Here at St. Joseph's, the primary form we do is the, nor the newer form, but we do once a month on Sunday have the older form at 2 p.m., and then every Tuesday at 5 p.m. we have the older form of the Mass. And it is more difficult to follow because it's in Latin. It is more complicated, and you don't see what the priest is doing because he's facing the same direction as you are. So it, it, you have to really concentrate more. You have to have uh, something in your hand that gives you the English translation. And, and, but it's, it is just as valid as the newer form, or I should say the newer form is just as valid as the older form. The older form goes back probably in the way that it is to about the 5th or 6th century. Uh, the newer form goes back to 1970, but that's not quite right. The newer form actually is more like the Mass was celebrated the first three or four centuries of the church. Okay, and then as time went on, it became more uh, elaborate, and we've kind of gone back to even a more ancient celebration, although it's newer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs>
So does anybody have any question on, on the two forms of the mass or anything that I've said thus far? Have I completely confused you? Pardon? What's, the, what's your question? Well, I, I felt like you sort of said the same thing, but sort of reversed it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't quite understand. Well, both masses do the same thing. Okay, We're experiencing the Word of God, the one sacrifice of Jesus, and we're receiving His body, blood, and soul, and divinity. The older form of the Mass is in Latin, thus a little bit more difficult to understand for the layperson, and it's more elaborate, the ceremony is. The newer form is in English, or the vernacular, is simplified and more comprehensible to the layperson because the priest is actually facing them and they can see what he's doing and there's, uh, it's, it's simplified, I think. But either way does the same thing. There's no difference in what it accomplishes other than some people would say the newer form makes it more intelligible and people can appropriate it better than the older form. Okay. But a lot of people who celebrate the older form will say that the newer form is too simple and they don't get the full meaning of what it is uh, uh, from that point of view. So there's controversy and I would say there's room uh, to appreciate both uh, today. Will the mass uh, eventually go back to completely English? Well, th that, that's a good question. The official language of the mass has always been, even to this day, Latin. Okay. It is by way of exception that we have the, the vernacular versions, okay? But Latin was never, even in the New Mass, the official language for the New Mass is Latin. Uh, and all translations of the official uh, of the Mass have to come from the Latin version, okay? So, so you can have a mix in the New Mass of English and Latin. There's more flexibility with the New Mass. You can have it all in English, part in English, you can have Spanish and Latin and English and Greek, uh, or you can have it all in one language. So, so there's a lot more flexibility. We are revising the English, uh, and once it's fully revised here at St. Joseph's, we will go back to the complete English, even with the, the Lord be with you and the parts that we're saying in Latin now. But that doesn't mean that we wouldn't use Latin occasionally. So the popes have always said, Catholics, even though we're allowing the Mass to be in English or in the vernacular now, should still know the Latin parts. They're not let off the hook. But what parish did that after Vatican II? Except here at St. Joseph's. Uh, so, 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 but but the, 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 the hope was that we would be able to do both. Uh, and so we've had this kind of a unique period with the Mass changing its English translation where we brought in a little bit more Latin until the new Mass is implemented, which is going to be a year from the first Sunday of Advent. Okay. Yes? Would it be correct to say then that uh, the English that we're going to is more accurately from the Latin? Correct, language? correct. The current English that we have, unfortunately, the principles that governed uh, the translation of the Mass in 1970 allowed for what's called dynamic equivalency, which means that they could paraphrase the Latin. And so a lot of our English Mass today is really not a, a direct translation of the Latin, but rather a paraphrase of it. And it eliminated some things that are in Latin. In uh, the year 1998, Pope John Paul II issued a new decree that said that, when we, when, that we have to retranslate all the vernacular Masses and we have to use a more literal model of translating from the original Latin to uh, whatever language you're translating it to. So for example, the paraphrase of Dominus Vobiscum, which is the Lord be with you, the response in Latin is et cum spiritu tuo, which the paraphrase of that in English is and also with you. But if you literally translate it, it means and with your spirit. So we're going to be going back to that uh, in English and with your spirit. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the Gloria, the Gloria that we say or sing currently is a paraphrase of the Latin Gloria and it leaves out almost two complete sentences. The new English translation will have every word translated word for word and those two sentences will be replaced. In the Creed, uh, in Latin is credo, which means I believe, but for some reason the English translators translated into we believe. You can't, I can't say what you believe. 
uh, I can only say what I believe. <laughs> so the new English translation will go back to I believe. Uh, and there was some poorly, uh, not just a paraphrased translation of the creed, but also a, a heresy uh, in translation where currently we say that, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. So when you say that, at what point did Jesus become a human? When he was born. Well, that's a heresy. It's a lie. It's not true. And for 40 years we've been saying that. Uh, and we're all condemned to hell for it. Uh, so, Jesus became man at the conception or the incarnation when Mary conceived him in her womb. And in Latin, you say by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the, whole, uh, of the Blessed Virgin Mary and became man at the moment of his conception. That will be restored uh, because that's what we believe. We don't believe this other thing that we've been saying we believe for the last four years. So anyway, the new translation um, uh, should make things more accurate and help us to have a more accurate faith. Any other question on that before I move on? I have a comment yes. about the priests, when they go to Rome or meet each other in different parts of the world, uh, are able to communicate because they all understand Latin, whereas they are unable to communicate with their own vernacular languages. So. Right. The, the, if, one of the interesting things was our choir saying at St. Peter's Basilica uh, about five years ago, four years ago, but before we sang at the Mass in the Basilica, we attended um, a beatification ceremony of several Spanish ma martyrs. It was a Sunday afternoon and it was outside. There were so many people there. It was probably uh, 50,000 people for this uh, uh, canonization and, um, or beatification. And most of them were Spaniards. And some of the Mass was in Spanish, so we didn't really understand it, although they gave us a booklet. But some of it was in Latin. Uh, the sung parts like the Gloria and the Sanctus and everybody sang the Latin, no matter what language they were, no matter what language they spoke. Whereas when it was in Spanish, when they sang things in Spanish, only the Spanish people were singing. But everybody joined in, in the Latin responses. And you really felt at one with these people that we were all singing the same language, uh, which, which the Latin does create. Uh, in fact, that's one of the things most people s say was sad about us dropping Latin altogether was that no matter what mass you went to throughout the world, it was the same and it was the same language, no matter where. Uh, and all you had to do was to bring your English missile with you and you had the English translation. But everybody else, if you were German or Italian or whatever, we, we were all hearing the mass in Latin. So there was a, a universal character there that we've lost. And, and Pope Benedict really hopes that we can recover some of that uh, as time goes on. So, what are the laws of the church in terms of the Mass? Well, Catholics have a serious obligation to gather with one another to celebrate the Lord's Supper or the Mass every Sunday. To willfully neglect this is considered seriously or mortally sinful. So, for Catholics, the obligation to attend Mass is for every Sunday of the year plus every holy day of obligation. And we have lots of holy days throughout the year, but there are a few that are called holy days of obligation. These are church laws that say that these particular uh, days are obligatory for us to go to Mass. In the United States, and it varies from country to country, so every, bishops, every country's bishops have to decide which ones will be their holy days of obligation. In the United States, for us, it's January 1st, which is New Year's Day, obviously, but the feast on New Year's Day is the feast of Mary, the Mother of God, and that's the reason why we go to Mass. Not because it's New Year's, but because it's the feast of Mary, the Mother of God. Then the next one would be um, in um, August, August 15th, which is the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Yes? Uh, you missed Ascension Well, um, that's a good point. <laughs> Unfortunately, and I regret this very much, uh, I don't know why they did this, the bishops, most of the bishops of the United States have transferred Ascension Thursday to the following Sunday. It's now Ascension Sunday, but not everywhere. Okay, so, now this is where church law gets confusing because some bishops can follow different laws. Uh, 
Okay, so if you're in Pennsylvania on an Ascension Thursday and you willfully miss Mass, you have committed a mortal sin. But if you're here in our diocese, it's not Ascension Thursday. Okay, so uh, because it's moved to the next, the following Sunday. Okay. okay, so we don't even celebrate Ascension Thursday on that day. Uh, uh, but the problem is, let me see. The problem is, if you're, let me think about this. If you're from Pennsylvania and you're visiting our diocese on Ascension Thursday, it's not Ascension Thursday. Okay. <laughs> so you're not going to go to the Ascension Thursday Mass because we don't have it here. If you fly back to Pennsylvania for the weekend, the following Sunday is not Ascension Sunday. So you will have missed Ascension altogether through no fault of your own because of a stupid law that we have that allows bishops to decide whether or not they can transfer it to the following Sunday. I think it was a mistake to do that. But normally Ascension Thursday would be a, a holy day of obligation if it were not moved to um, the next Sunday, and which we've done, unfortunately. And the other thing, and this is where legalism really kills us, uh, and, and it's kind of humorous, if the Holy Day of Obligation falls on a Saturday or a Monday, the obligation to attend is removed. Because we don't want to overburden you by making you come to Mass Saturday and Sunday, or Sunday and Monday. Okay, That's a recent phenomenon as well. Yes? Okay, so um, I think it was two weeks ago I did this reading, and then I believe it was the, um, forgive me, but it's whenever we celebrate the those in purgatory. Um, well, the saints. The, uh, November, November 1st is all, and then All Souls Day is the no November 2nd. Okay. Um, all Saints Day is a holy day of obligation. What about All Souls Day? It's not. It's not. A, that's optional. Okay. Okay. That explains that. Okay. But All Saints Day <laughs> fell on a Monday this year, so the obligation to attend, but next year will be on a Tuesday, so if you miss it on Tuesday next year, it's a sin. Because it's an obligation next Tuesday, okay? <laughs> okay, you see? So this is the authority of the church to bind and loose, and we use church law sometimes to do that. Um, and this is purely a church law, these holy days of obligation. Uh, so it's really part of the church's law on that. Be in our it's always in the bulletin, right, right. I used to not tell people they had an option. I said, now, Monday is November 1st, and we have All Saints Day Mass, and I hope you see you at Mass. They don't know that, you know, they could opt out if they wanted to. But, <laughs> so, <laughs> because it's a Monday. Okay, so uh, let me see that. So January 1st, Ascension uh, Thursday, if in, depending on where you might be living. Um, August 15th, the Assumption. Um, December, or November 1st, uh, All Saints. And then December 8th, which is the Immaculate Conception. Have I left anyone out? December 25th. Oh, and Christmas, of course, is a Holy Day of Obligation as well. Right. right. And that, no matter what, with Christmas Day, uh, it's always a Holy Day of Obligation, even if it falls on a Saturday or a Monday. Okay? There's, that one does not get a pass. Okay? <laughs> and... Um, the editors of our book. I don't think they, they don't understand that. <laughs> They're dummies. <laughs> the ones I wrote that. And the other one that does not get a pass uh, is December 8th. Because Mary, under, our t of the, under the title of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception, is the patroness of the United States of America. And so if that feast falls on a Saturday or Monday, it's still a, an obligation. Okay. I'm sorry, it does say that right below that. I just uh, misspoke. It does say the, the editors wrote a book for. And this is a r relatively recent thing, this, this moving Ascension Thursday and this option, this, this thing about dropping the ob obligation on Mondays and Saturdays. That's like within the, since I've been ordained, so it has to be within the last maybe uh, 15 years or so. Uh, so it's relatively new and unfortunate from my point of view. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. If a Catholic is in a state of serious sin or mortal sin, which has not been forgiven, they should not receive Holy Communion when they come to Mass until they have gone to confession. But they should still come to Mass and participate in every way except for actually receiving Communion. And you could still come forward and receive a blessing if you felt like uh, you were in a state of mortal sin and still needed to go to confession. So does everybody understand that? Because if you receive communion in a state of mortal sin, you receive unworthily, and the graces that God wants to give you are um, co-opted by the state that your soul is in. 
Uh, so for example, if you would think of your soul as in the forgiven state as clean and pristine and ready to receive our Savior, okay? If you would then think of your soul in the unforgiven state in terms of mortal sin as a cesspool of debauchery, do you want to receive your Lord in that setting? You see what I'm saying? So confession is what returns the soul back to its pristine state to receive our Lord. Does that make sense? So to receive our Lord in the state of mortal sin is to commit another sin because you're bringing our Lord into a cesspool. Uh, and therefore, the graces that you would have ordinarily have gotten from receiving our Lord are compromised and in fact uh, work against you. You sense? should fast for one hour before receiving Holy Communion. Now, when I was a child, when children were really children, the fast... <laughs> The fast was from midnight until you would uh, receive communion. Um, and you could not have anything, including water, from midnight. Uh, so what, did you, what do you think the practice of most Catholics was in, in, when the church law was that you had to fast from solid food and liquids, including water? You went to early mass, and they usually had 5 a.m. mass on Sundays uh, because... Uh, uh, you, if you broke the fast, you still had to go to Mass, but you couldn't receive communion, okay? Uh, so I, I can remember after I made my first communion, my father asking me on Sunday morning when I woke up, do you want breakfast or do you want to go to Holy Communion? He gave me the option. Well, you know, here I'm eight years old. No, uh, so, so. <laughs> Well, sometimes we ate breakfast and we didn't go to communion, you know. Uh, and that's just the way it was. The, on a, any given Sunday, when we have this strict fast, the majority of people on Sunday did not receive communion. And it wasn't because they were necessarily in a state of mortal sin. It was because they broke the fast. And there was no sin to break the fast. The only sin was if you received when you broke the fast. You could break the fast, but then you could not receive. But, and that was allowed. Okay, uh, because, uh, so, and most people would go to an earlier Mass. But then the Church, in her wisdom, after Second Vatican Council, realized that this was preventing a lot of people from going to communion. A lot of people were passing out during Mass because they hadn't had anything to eat or drink. And uh, so it went to three hours, okay, before receiving Holy Communion. And then they uh, uh, relaxed it a little bit where you could drink some water and take medicine. And then the church even relaxed it further to where it's not, it's, it's one hour, and not before Mass, one hour before receiving Holy Communion. So there's really no reason why anybody should miss uh, receiving Holy Communion because the, the fast is so simplified now. But because it is so simplified, I find it's interesting, more people, people were more scrupulous about it when it was strict, and now that it's so simple, Nobody even thinks about it. So you see people chewing gum and drinking uh, soda and, and eating right up until the time they come to Mass, and then they receive communion. And, and it's only been a half hour mass uh, fast for them. So, so that's a problem. Yes? Just, just a comment. I'm, I'm reading a book right now that's about uh, a priest who was working in uh, Siberia in the Soviet Union after World War II. It was talking about the Catholics and the priests that were working in these concentration camps uh, in Siberia. And he pointed out that if they knew that they were going to have an opportunity to sneak off and have mass, say at 10 or 11 o'clock the next morning, even though they were subsisting on the smallest of rations, they would skip breakfast just for the opportunity because they knew they were going to have mass. Yes, that's that true. Important. Yeah, yeah. And again, yeah. they just had, they, they fed them just enough mm -hmm. really to survive. And mm -hmm. just, but that's how important yeah. it was to yeah. them. Yeah. And the reason for the fast is. Um, kind of uh, linked to the need for the soul to be pure, that it's a symbol for that, that uh, just as you want your soul to be uncontaminated by sin when you receive Holy Communion, you want your stomach to be uncontaminated by food when you receive our Lord in Holy Communion. Uh, so, so that's part of the, the, the symbolism of the fast, which we've kind of lost now with the, the simpler form of the fast. Sometimes you will hear the term Easter duty. Easter duty means that during the season of Lent or the season of Easter, you must go to confession and receive Holy Communion. 
Um, um, so Catholics must go to confession at least once a year and normally during the Lenten or uh, Easter season. But the encouragement of the church is that we would go much more frequently. Uh, but you should do, the, the, the least, the minimal that you should do is at least once a year and at Easter. And of course we have the liturgical year uh, which begins, the, the, the liturgical year always be, begins with Advent which is two Sundays from now. So this Sunday is the 33rd Sunday of Ordinary Time. The following Sunday when you go through the rite of welcome is Christ the King Sunday, which is always the last Sunday of the liturgical year. Then the next Sunday will be the first Sunday of Advent and we begin a whole new liturgical year. And in fact, you'll notice that our missalettes will change and we'll have brand new missalettes uh, the first Sunday of Advent uh, that will conclude next Christ the King Sunday. So, uh, so Advent begins the liturgical year, and that is a preparation for Christmas. Christmas is a season that lasts about three weeks or two weeks, <coughs> and it concludes with uh, Epiphany and Baptism of the Lord, which is usually uh, the first Sunday in January or the second Sunday in January. Then we have what's called Winter Ordinary Time, and the color, uh, well, for Advent, the color of the vestments is violet. For Christmas, it's white or gold. For winter ordinary time, it's green, and that's a relatively short period of time from the baptism of the Lord until Ash Wednesday. And as you know, Easter fluctuates in, in the date of it based upon the alignment of the sun and the stars and all the rest of that. Uh, so sometimes um, Ash Wednesday is very early. Uh, the earliest it can be, I think, is like in February, the middle of February. Or it could be much later, uh, and I think the latest it can be is late March. Um, so that period of time from the baptism of the Lord to Ash Wednesday is either long or short, depending on when Lent begins and Easter is celebrated. Lent is the violet color because it's penitential preparing for the Easter season. It lasts six weeks, uh, and it concludes with Palm Sunday, which leads into Holy Thursday and Easter Sunday following that. Easter is another seven-week period uh, that culminates with the celebration of Pentecost, and then we're back into the spring and summer of ordinary time, which we're still in, uh, uh, fall as well, uh, and that will conclude, as I mentioned, uh, in two weeks. So the Holy Eucharist, or the Mass, has different, different, many different layers of meaning. It is an act of worship, it's a ritual, it's an action, it's sharing the body and blood of Christ, it unites Catholics, uh, it remembers who Jesus is, and it brings us into the abiding presence of the Lord. And as I mentioned, he is truly and substantially present, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And that's why we genuflect before our Lord when we receive communion or bow before we receive him, and the priest would genuflect after the consecration, and when we put the Lord uh, the, the Eucharist in the tabernacle, we would genuflect uh, before the tabernacle. In terms of the bread and wine being a metaphor for Jesus, think of what bread does for you, and then think Jesus. This is what he's doing for me when I receive him. So bread uh, nourishes and sustains. It keeps you alive. Uh, it brings you together when you share it with somebody else. Jesus does that through his life, death, and resurrection. He nourishes and sustains us. He keeps us alive unto life everlasting in heaven, and, uh, or saves us unto life everlasting. And he brings us together. He unites us as his body. Think of what wine does. Wine has um, medicinal characteristics. If you pour wine over a wound, it'll bring healing. Uh, it has the characteristic of bringing joy to one's life, uh, in moderation. Uh, it um, brings warmth to the heart, and when friends share wine, it brings them together, it unites them. That's what Jesus does in the Eucharist. He brings joy to the heart, uh, he unites people, he heals the wounds of sin, uh, and uh, he keeps us together. So the Mass has many different layers of meaning, and all of this is meant to unite us in Christ and to lead us to eternal life in heaven. So every time we participate in the Mass, we're participating in the heavenly banquet that the saints are experiencing in the here and now in heaven. Uh, so we're, we're stepping out of uh, the limits of this world's time and stepping into 
the outer limits of eternity, which is what heaven is. And we're at the eternal wedding banquet of heaven at every Mass. In fact, someone once said that if the second coming of Christ occurred when we were at Mass celebrating it, we wouldn't know the difference because Christ is, is present to us already at the Mass. Uh, so that's a very important thing for us to keep in mind that the Mass really is otherworldly in the sense of bringing us out of the uh, present world, the secular world, and placing us in our true home, which is heaven, uh, where Christ is present, the saints are present, the angels are present, uh, and they all glorify God. Um, and so, so at every Mass, even if it's just me and an altar server, we believe that the entire church is there as well, especially the, the church in heaven.